My name is Brett Chadwick, and today I'd like to introduce DriveLock application whitelisting. In the past, application whitelisting has gotten a bad reputation as being a difficult to implement and manage technology, but with a very effective outcome, blocking unknown executables, PowerShell scripts, and other scripts like command line, batch file, shell scripts from executing on an endpoint. Whitelisting can be used to secure endpoints from execution of unknown files viruses, malware, phishing attacks. It can help manage image drift over time and enforce licensing compliance on endpoints, ensuring that you don't exceed uh, the vendor's licensing requirements. All while removing the need to remove admin rights from users, which for a decade has proven a difficult proposition for most companies. DriveLock has been in the whitelisting business for nearly 20 years, which is really the entire life of the whitelisting product as a technology. The approach has changed significantly over time, and it's made management and the creation of the whitelist much easier. DriveLock includes many of the industry first in the whitelisting category. Global settings for whitelisting allow for audit mode to start off for deployment, a complete simulation mode to test whitelists, and finally the whitelist or blacklist mode to be enforced on endpoints. And just for clarity's sake, whitelisting permits only those files on the whitelist to execute. So, for example, you might allow Word.exe to be executed. But if somebody downloads Notepad++.exe, that would not be permitted to execute if it was not on the whitelist. A black, blacklisting blocks only those files that are on the blacklist. So, a completely opposite approach to whitelisting. So, for example, you might put Notepad++ on that list of blacklist files. Everything else would be permitted to execute except for Notepad++. So, DriveLock's whitelisting offers a selection of algorithms used to meet compliance requirements such as SHA-1, SHA-224, SHA-256, SHA-384, and SHA-512. The application hash database allows you to generate the whitelist automatically from endpoints, allowing you to scan machines, images, and remote machines, virtual machines, and other infrastructure servers, or desktops, workstations, laptops, and bring back a detailed list of every file on those machines. This is done by scanning the local or remote network machines, their file system, UNC, or network pass automatically directly from the server. After a few minutes, you'll have a new hash database generated and stored on the DriveLock management server. You'll be able to view each one of those files that has been added to the whitelist and review the whitelist and easily manage it automatically. The ongoing management of the whitelist is really critical to the success of any whitelisting deployment. And this is done in DriveLock using the industry-leading automation to reduce the resources needed for management. The first in this list of automatic management is Publisher Certificate Rules. This allows files, packages, and executables signed with a specific certificate to be allowed execution on endpoint, endpoints. This manages the whitelist for you without the need for manual whitelist manipulation. Using this method, these files will automatically be allowed to run and added to the whitelist. Second is through file ownership rules. This would really fall into the mandatory access control, allowing for execution of files owned by specific owners. They can be used, executed, they can create and own those files. Administrators or some other specific groups may be able to execute files as well. You can choose to do that by adding in those help desk users, those administrators, so that they can automatically execute files on endpoints without the same restrictions as your normal users. The third mechanism is through direct hash management. So you may have files or applications that you want to add 
or binaries that you want to add directly to the whitelist that you know will need, be needed on these machines. And you can do that very easily by scanning and creating a hash of those files, picking out those files and adding those directly in. So for example here, this is a command.exe, which I can add in and I have a hash for it. So I can automatically allow that to be executed directly by managing the whitelist. This would be the most manual way, but it's sometimes needed in, in certain situations. And fourth is our special rules. So special rules uh, can be executed on specific actions or at specific times. One example of this is configured by default, which is allow automatic updates. So this allows Windows updates and automatic updates on machines without you having to do anything. So you can automatically patch and update those machines without having to add those files to the whitelist, which makes it very easy for you to automatically manage that whitelist using that process. So this is a trusted process that is able to manage the whitelist for you. Another example is a rule allowing Windows core system files, allow Windows OS components, or our allow drive lock components rule which allows all components directly related to the drive lock product on the endpoint to execute and manage the whitelist for you. And finally, we have our file name and path rules. File name and path rules allow you to specify super special admin share or program files paths or windows paths or any path that you wish to have applications executed from. So in this example, I'll open up my super special admin share path. Then you can see that the path that I've allowed. So any files within or found in that path would be executable on the endpoint. Now we can apply additional permissions to those. So only selected users or groups can execute those. We can add custom messages to the execution to allow me to know that those are special files or that I shouldn't be executing them. We can add time limit or time bombs to those executions. We can specify which network this is active on. So maybe it's active inside the corporate network, but when I leave and go home, it is not active. And we can specify specific computers that this applies to. Combining these together to create a very granular level of control of who has access to execute from that particular share or that path. We can do the same with blacklisting to blacklist specific paths from users. And finally, the last topic today will be our application templates. This allows you to very easily create the building blocks required to control your whitelist. It's a fine grain control over your whitelist, allowing you to add packages of applications in to be executed on the endpoint. So, for example, in this case, I've added Microsoft Office 2007. I've taken advantage of this because we have a pre-built database that you can import with applications. And so I've selected the specific application I wanted, in this case, Office 2007, and it has brought in all of the files required to execute Office 2007 on the endpoint. So I didn't have to do anything. Then I can go through and I can add my additional permissions to which users or groups have access, where I want it to execute, what networks it executes on, what computer, and any time limits around those. And I can apply this to my endpoints. I can use this to add applications like Salesforce, WebEx, Skype, applications that update themselves and change over time to create building blocks that I can add to my whitelist and use them to manage my whitelist as the machine changes, as the network changes, or the company changes, or the job, or the user's role changes, and they move to a new position where they require new applications. I can add those in very easily without making any change, major changes or whitelisting changes. Thank you.